back uh, after coffee break. It's uh, probably a little bit longer than planned, but we can start with, with first uh, lecture of this afternoon session that's devoted uh, again to ablation of supraventricular arrhythmias. And the first presentation will be done by Tony de Potter, and the topic is AFib ablation using a deep freezing. Yes, there are my slides. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, we can so, hear you. <clears throat> the topic in this is the, uh, the use of ultra low temperature cryoablation in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. These are uh, disclosures relevant <clears throat> to this presentation. And um, the topic of today's talk and today's technology that we're going to show in the live case in a second is the use of liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen for the ablation of atrial fibrillation. Is liquid nitrogen is an energy source that is very attractive um, in different aspects. Of course, it is well studied. It is used in open surgery for decades and it is well known to be highly efficient and very safe uh, ablation technology. The problem with using liquid nitrogen in a percutaneous setting is, to put it very simply, is the problem of gas evacuation. If you boil liquid nitrogen, the gas expands so fast that you simply cannot evacuate it rapidly enough and then of course the flow stops and then you get a phenomenon called vapor lock and the innovation that this technology um, brings to the field of uh, interventional EP is shown here again in a more visual way is compressing the liquid nitrogen to a phase which is called near critical nitrogen at which point there is no more difference in um, volume between um, the liquid state and the gas state and the end result is what you can see on the right the end result is a catheter that is able to freeze due to the power of liquid nitrogen that is easily able to achieve uh, lethal freezing temperatures in the free running bloodstream. Of course, we all know the cryo balloon and we all know the cryo balloon is vulnerable to leaks because the blood will warm the balloon. And this technology solves that issue because it is uh, far more powerful and powerful enough to overcome the heat sink of the blood. Uh, technically, the system looks like this. There is a console which you can see on the, uh, in the middle and on the left a catheter, a catheter which in itself has no particular shape and derives its shape, gets a shape by inserting stylets, much like you would insert a stylet in a pacemaker lead that otherwise has no shape of its own. This catheter will get a circular or a linear or a focal shape depending on the stylet that you insert. The design we used for most of the research work that I'm about to show you looks like this. There is a freezing element here uh, in the um, middle of the uh, of the screen, I can't see my m mouse cursor, but I'm sure you can see it on the screen. So you can see an ice ball, and you can see distal to the ice ball, you can see a diagnostic element, and on the right you can see what that translates to, that shape. We can use it to isolate pulmonary veins, of course, and easily reach um, pulmonary veins. We can also use the same design to approach uh, different targets. Um, the case we're going to show you today is an evolution of that design. So on the left you see the design we used in our clinical studies with a distal diagnostic end. We've moved to the point where we are confident enough that our lesions will be okay, that we don't need to check them real time. We will check them at the end of the case, of course, but we do not feel the need to check them real time anymore. And so the design you see on the right is a more simplified design that only contains the freezing element. But as mentioned, all the published data so far, all the research work we have, done does include the diagnostic element and this is what you'll see in this presentation. So this is how a typical case looks like. Here you can see uh, what EGMs look like on the ablation element and then in the vein in the diagnostic element and you can see that once we start freezing of course we lose information from the EGMs because the electrodes are covered in the ice ball as you can see on the bottom of the screen and you can see that with progressive ablation we can obliterate the, uh, the potentials in the pulmonary vein and after a single application, typically hope to isolate the particular vein that we are targeting. 
usually we apply a 30 to maximum 60 second freeze for every pulmonary vein location, a bonus freeze of the same duration. The duration of the initial freeze depended in our research on the time to isolation. If we achieve very fast isolation, we see no point in continuing. And the catheter is also very easily adapted for uh, posterior wall ablation, of course. The same shape can be used to obliterate uh, electrograms over the posterior wall, where for safety considerations, we have never uh, applied more than 30 seconds of freezing energy. Again, to show you what it looks like in practice, here you see the power or the potential power of such a system for achieving single shot isolation of a particularly large left common ostium. This is a left common trunk, I would say 35 millimeters in diameter. And you can see that once we start freezing, we lose electrograms on the freezing element. And you can see that almost immediately on the bottom in the white, there is delay on the PV signal and you will see the PVs disappear about 30 to uh, 40 seconds into, into this ablation. All again uh, achieved using the same catheter element that now simply has a large stylet inside of it to make the loop as large as possible. So here you can see loss of one-to-one -one conduction and you will see the isolation any second. Now here we go. 40 seconds into the freeze, this massive common ostium is isolated with a single cryo application. In our um, uh, initial uh, clinical study, we reported a very high clinical efficacy in terms of acute success rates. Um, for a first in man study, we achieved PV isolation in 97% of uh, all targets, and we achieved um, ablation of the posterior wall and the cavo tricuspid isthmus in all patients uh, where we tried, except for one cavo tricuspid isthmus. We tried mitral isthmus with variable success in the seven, in, out of the 10 patients where we tried mitral isthmus ablation, we were successful in seven. The clinical results we published from this initial study um, were reported a few months ago. So this is the one-year outcome of our study where we recruited paroxysmal as well as persistent atrial fibrillation patients. Actually, the majority of the study were persistent atrial fibrillation patients. Out of 65 patients in total, 44 were persistent, and you can see at, uh, on the survival curves on the um, bottom right of the graph, you can see that the survival for the entire patient cohort and the survival for the persistent cohort is very favorable and actually quite similar. And if we compare this to existing reports, you can see on the left that in controlled settings, as we might expect, if we look at meta-analyses for a catheter ablation or surgical ablation, we see variable results that certainly do not exceed these numbers. And on the right, you can see observational data data, uh, cryo balloon, the recent um, surgical hybrid results, and our results on the right, I'm not going to claim they're better, it's observational data. We've seen Benjamin present the high power data, for example, which is also in the same order of magnitude, but I think the numbers can compete with the best reported numbers in observational settings. And I think beyond um, the case of persistent ablation, the technology um, we're going to show you also has um, particular use cases in redo ablations. If you think beyond the pulmonary veins, if we start thinking about uh, additional strategies for PV isolation, and in particular, if we think about what to do with patients with isolated veins, no matter what the strategies we think about, the end result is always some kind of large ablation, some kind of area ablation. And so, of course, to efficiently um, deliver these area ablation strategies, we need an area ablation tool, which is precisely what I think this catheter is. Finally, the latest developments, we're not going to show you that today, but to show you what we're working on is integrating this uh, cryoablation modality in a hybrid cryo PFA uh, energy application. And uh, just to show you the reasoning behind this, this is not a uh, story of me too. Everybody is doing PFA, so we want to do it too. There is a particular benefit of doing post field ablation inside a cryo application, that, and that is that there is zero micro bubble formation. Here you can see a PFA application and you can see the resulting micro bubbles in the image in the middle and on the right. And you can see the same high voltage PFA delivery within a cryo freeze, within uh, an ice ball, where of course the micro bubbles are entirely contained. 
visually speaking, the same data. You can see the volume of micro bubbles on the left with PFA only, and on the right, totally different scale, uh, several orders of magnitude lower the micro bubble formation. And even more visually, you see here the same uh, post field application on the, on the left. Um, I'm going to need some help to play this video. No, it doesn't play. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if somebody is able to press play here. I guess not, but what you can see on the still frame is uh, equally um, visual. You can see on the left the micro bubbles resulting from a PFA application, and on the right, same pulse strain, same pulse field application, but now contained within the ice ball. And this concept is being studied in a uh, clinical validation study, which we call PFCA, pulse field cryo ablation, randomizing patients to PFA only versus pulse field cryo ablation. And in conclusion, I think we all agree that cryoablation is established and efficient uh, treatment modality for PV isolation. Ultra-low temperature cryoablation enables safe and efficient wide area ablation. And the clinical outcome of our persistent AFIP cohort appears competitive with the best in class, although, of course, all we have is observational data. We saw this morning an early feasibility study for VT, and I've just shown you that we are also researching the concept of synergistic PFA ablation, which is definitely an attractive concept, which leads us to believe that the ice age is far from over. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, next speaker, uh, Marco Scangurion. No. Is it? Okay, thank you. Marco, do you hear us? We are waiting for your presentation. Thank you. So again, thanks to Joseph and Peter for the invitation. And uh, Joseph uh, asked me to, to give a talk about the principle of zero four in SVT. And I, I thought to, to give you a sort of practical talk just for beginner in order to explain how to reach this goal. And these are my disclosure, but I have one most important disclosure and is that uh, yesterday I, I was transformed by two aliens. So, moving on. Uh, I think that again, when to, you have to overcome uh, the obstacles of the procedure, in this case also the zero fluoro approach, you have first to know the target, the right target, and then to choose the strategy, but above all to, to choose the right tool. And the first question right, is why zero fluoro strategy? Because just yesterday, evening, uh, having dinner, I met some skeptical guys about this, oh, because it's not so important. I will uh, prove that really uh, to reach the zero floor may be really important because I have the evidence that X-ray are harmful. And just to show you in a sort of uh, impressive way, this is one guy right now, and I will see with you, I will show you in a while, what uh, has been produced by more or less 30 years of X-ray exposure, because this was at the beginning. <laughs> and after 30 years, this is the result. So I think it's uh, mandatory, mandatory to avoid to exposure in ourselves. But not only for this, also because we have to accomplish with the LARA principle, okay? Not only for your patient, but also for yourself and the stuff that is in the lab. And despite in the recent years, there is, of course, a decrease in the uh, X-ray exposure. I think that five minutes, three minutes for each procedure, every day, two, three, four procedures a day, I think that at the end, if you will reach in your, uh, let me say, job life, uh, more or less 54 millisieverts of exposure, you will have a risk of cancer which is one out of 200, I think is not so negligible. And for the skeptical, again, that may say that may be less effective or less safe than fluoroguided, it is not, but it is proven that it is at least the same. But I will show you 
that may be much more effective and much more safe than with the fluoroguided. And again, I apologize for you because uh, giving the talk from here, I haven't the possibility to have the audio, but he's saying that you can do it, okay? And so how to reach this goal? I think that first of all, you need the right technology, then to be trained to do this, but above all, finally, you need your will, and you, ch you have to change your mindset. And it has been well postulated that you have to use the 3D um, electronic mapping system. And you see that uh, in, with these two multicenter study coming from Italy here, uh, you see that every kind of physician were able to reach in this uh, study 72% of zero floor of cases and 86. And you reach a very short learning curve. You see that after more or less 30 cases, you will decrease uh, your floor exposure. And uh, above all, we have to have a reliable tool. And uh, more or less uh, 12 years ago, we demonstrated that with the CAR2 tree, for example, being able to visualize in a reliable way, you see here the comparison with two projections, an X-ray and the, um, the reproduction of the shape of the catheter, we were able for AF, if compared the procedure just based floor only with the cartomate procedure and the car to tree visualizing all the catheters to reduce to more than two minutes uh, of the uh, entire floor uh, for the, the entire procedure and right now we confine uh, our exposure to less than one minute and a half just confined to the transepta puncture because we decide for a matter of cost and discomfort for the patient to avoid the eyes and the, the TE echo and uh, just having uh, crossed the septum before and after, you do not need the floor anymore. And in case of patency of the form of ALE, and we published this paper, you see that in more or less 20% of patients, if you check the patency of the form of ALE, we, you can find it. And in this case, you can perform a completely floorless AF ablation procedure. And again, for the skeptical, there is any modification in the outcome because you can manage the catheters properly also through the, the PFO. And moving in a, let me say, much more sensitive court of patients, so in pediatric field, uh, there were more or less five uh, reports, five papers, uh, being able to demonstrate that it is possible to perform a zero floor in more than 90% of cases, and two are coming from our group. But if you put just 100% of zero floor, remaining just two. One is uh, in our lab with left, uh, facing with left and right side of the accessory pattern, another one with the left atrial uh, uh, accessory pattern, but in this case using the eyes. In our case, without any other system than the CARTO. And right now we perform the ablation procedure in children in, in different setting, more than 500 uh, procedure. You see in the last 10 years, 100% of zero floor. And we published uh, in 2013, the possibility to combine first the uh, cryo uh, catheter with the CARTO, and uh, these two patients were the last two patients where we had to spend 50 and 45 seconds of X-ray to solve a problem with the difficult femoral access, and were the last two patients where we had to spend some seconds of X-ray. And moving, uh, considering the EVNRT ablation that you will see with the live case, first of all, we have to talk about the target. The target, is, of course, is the slow pathway, considering that the AV node uh, has uh, two horns, but anyway, at least one, the posterior one, will lies just in between the coronary sinus and the tricuspid ring in the posteroceptal space of the triangle of cork. And in 1992, three methodology arose. One was purely anatomical and the other two uh, electroanatomic uh, based. One coming from the group of Jackman and another one coming from the group of Michelle Seguer and Gaetan, uh, our group, because at that time uh, Gaetan was my chief. And uh, we, of course, used the so-called slow pathway potential. And you may see here the meaning. Uh, this is a, a picture that I made at that time. I draw at the time in 1992, just to unveil that after having produced a transient uh, 
uh, traumatic block of the fast pathway of the fast nodal pathway you see here the conduction through the slow only through the slow pathway and you see atrial electron ventricular electron the slow potential which is close to the atrial activity here in the posterior septal space is the true uh, sign of the slow pathway uh, conduction while moving up you see that there is uh, a modification in the timing so the potential becomes in, the in between the two, pot the two atrial and ventricular potential and there is a an his that is appearing so starting from this point and going up you are in the compact and then in the fibrous body with the his bundle the compact AV node here and move on and this is very important to uh, perform a safe procedure. And uh, how you can navigate uh, uh, the chamber without fluoroscopy, just using in this way a decanav, uh, creating a matrix reaching the right atrium, then using a biplane way, unveiling the first uh, reference, which is the his bundle potential here, then rotating clockwise and withdrawing the catheter, you may engage also, this is of course, accelerated twice, you may engage the coronary sinus without any use of fluoroscopy, then put, if you want, a tetrapolar catheter into the ventricle using the matrix to be visualized, and then a second his bundle catheter here in the his bundle region, all without any fluoro use. And it is not only a matter of zero fluoro, it is also a matter of 3D reconstruction, because considering this, we were able to reproduce perfectly the triangle of cork of that patient that we have on the bed, the coronary sinus os here with the catheter inside. You can tag the position with the his bundle recording, the AV node, the compact AV node potential, and then finally the slow pathway that uh, you may see here potential, being able to unveil the real anatomy of that patient. And in this case, you can do it if you want to reconstruct all the chamber or just in a biplane way, again, in a sort of uh, mimicking the, fluoro, uh, the fluoroscopic view, and then just putting a tag, considering the his position, then the node with the superimposition of the very small his bundle, and then reaching the AV node position, and finally the slow pathway, as you may see here. Then you can also measure the distance, for example, between your point of interest in order to design the strategy to be safe. But why is it important to have the 3D anatomy on board? Because you can unveil a strange uh, triangle of cock. This is a flat triangle with the heat, which is just at the level of the coronary sinus os. Or, as in this case, due to the persistency of the left su superior vena cava, a huge coronary sinus with the node that is on the roof of this uh, uh, huge inlet to the to this venous system and considering this we published in 1999 in uh, this uh, book edited by Michel and Zeiss uh, we were able to have a very high percentage of success with two blocks that were confined 1992 and 1996 and since then no other block so we performed more than uh, 2,000 AVRT ablation without any block. How is it possible? Because we had on board also since 2000 the cryo technique and combining the zero floor with the now. At the, that time, the 3D anatomy and uh, the cryo map, you may succeed safely. And moving toward the uh, accessory pathway, you see our report again in pediatric field, uh, both in the right and, si uh, and left side of the accessory pathway. In all the cases, without any fluoro uh, exposure, no complication, with a complete success, and how to do it? Because you have to try to reproduce the, the curve that you may decide to perform inside the arch or just at the root in the aorta if you have to perform a retrograde approach, and you will see that you can do it, uh, in this case, navigating retrograde the aorta, then the arch reaching the root, and then closing the catheter in order to perform the curve, the arch, and then gently pushing, entering the ventricle, and being able to navigate in a biplane again to reach the mitral anus, or if you want also, uh, without any 
reconstruction you see just navigating again in biplane view the arch the root it is unmasked by the presence of the his bundle the, here then reconstructing a draft reconstruction of the aorta if you want and then you can also move to create the loop in a posterior way not to do not engage the left main then gently pushing entering and then reaching in this case the left lateral aspect and then being able also to renavigate because you can put a tag and if you lose the position you can renavigate this position in order to be much more effective and also in uh, some difficult cases as in this case we can combine the cryoblation of an uh, paraitian accessory pathway you see the the site good uh, parameters disappearance during the cryo map of the uh, pre-excitation and look at this we had at the at the end when we stopped the cryo application a huge his uh, recording from the ablation catheter and how you can do it because you can create the matrix navigating the superior vena cava then the left subclavian vein here and in this case you can have visible also the other diagnostic catheter and the cryo catheter is like a diagnostic catheter and then you can move on to navigate this venous system with the cryoablation catheter here then reach your site of interest in the anteroceptal space and then map being able to have this kind of results okay without any floral and then during the cryo map you see the disappearance of pre-excitation here also in other cases and approaching the end of my talk you can also have some uh, tachycardia like this a left bundle branch block tachycardia in a young patient with the quite almost normal basal EKG because it's due to the presence of uh, a behind fiber and in this case you see again after having reconstructed the the, uh, the anatomy we left the coronary sinus catheter here the ventricular and the his and then we put the ablation catheter just to push uh, right-sided close to the supposed uh, presence of the accessory part we were able to the, to obtain a left bundle branch block morphology during pacing and you see that his is entering the ventricle because this is a pre-excitation and mapping push, positioning the coronary sinus catheter here you were able to unveil in this part of the tricuspid ring this potential which is the behind fiber potential you see here and moving toward the ventricle again floroless you can also unveil the the path of the pathway with the potential which is up closing to the ventricle aspect because we are entering into the ventricle or in another case it's like in this case you see it seems to be a left side accessory pathway i, I apologize to you uh, for a technical problem we missed the v3 uh, but was not because it was a really strange anatomy it was a, a completely cavo pulmonary bypass extra cardiac so the only way to reach the heart was through the aorta you see here a, a, a interventricular defect with an accessory right ventricular chamber here the aorta and in this case we were able to unveil this good site you see the bipolar uh, fusion with the qs unipolar but was not left-sided because was we opened it uh, with the cart to the 3d because i'm just using a one si a single catheter approach unveil the position of the his here and the position of the accessory pathway was mid septal and ablating here being able to unveil this anatomy we succeeded safely so in conclusion i think that we can say about feasibility of the zero floor approach in svt yes it is feasible and what about safety and at least in our experience but uh, uh, is growing up also with other centers we can say that it's safe in proper end and if you are well trained to uh, up to uh, use the appropriate methodology and is also effective but i think that first of all as uh, charles darwin said so that is not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent 
but is the the speeches that is uh, able to to be adaptable okay that is most adaptable to change so i can advise you to change your mind toward the zero fluoro because this is the first step to reach this goal thank you for your attention So the uh, Joseph, do you talk about the? Uh, I have some. Uh, uh, okay. Just a short presentation Soon. about uh, new development on Farapal's technology. Okay. okay. Thank you, Joseph. Please go ahead. I was able to. Can I have slides? I was able to, to test a new development on Farapal's technology. You, you heard about this, and you know that it does not have any mapping system. So you basically work with Fluoro. You have to rotate uh, the, <clears throat> the device uh, based on Fluoro imaging. So obviously, uh, as you heard, zero Fluoro should be uh, more or less uh, standard or near zero Fluoro. So that is reflected by new development which is called Farawave NAV, and that basically uh, is a tool that can be uh, displayed in Rhythmia system, <coughs> and that's the integration, that's the, the goal of, of this technology, uh, to reduce fluoro and also to, to display or to enable operator to map with uh, uh, the catheter, with Farawave catheter, and um, also to, to uh, maximize reproducibility because not everybody can use intracardiac echo to align uh, the device. Uh, although I believe that this is important, but if not, then better than just fluoro is, is to have a 3D electroanatomical map. And uh, the, the beauty of this system is that it contains in the, in the shaft a nav sensor, so <coughs> and it, it can display different um, different uh, uh, appearances of the of the catheter uh, like flower or, or basket and here is an example of how it works uh, you can you can do the map of uh, the left atrium or pulmonary veins and then you can position your uh, catheter within uh, the map and you can do ablation and it does not display individual points, but it displays kind of zones around uh, the ablation tool. So uh, I was able to, to test in K9, uh, which was 40 kilo uh, weight. And as you know, a dog has a small atrium with uh, veins which are really close to each other. And a right one is really angled. So we were not able to go to right one, but we ablated also appendage. And uh, you can see that the map can be done very nicely, although in human it's much easier, I must say. And uh, yeah, this is example how you can see what you can see on X-ray, but here you have a nice map uh, with the left-sided veins and the right superior vein and right inferior we did not map, as I mentioned. So you can see that you are really uh, going vein by vein. And um, you see when you apply, you, you have this uh, zone which uh, marks the zone of application of uh, pulse field. And then you can rotate with your tool without the need for X-ray. And you can rotate just uh, to, to get in between two petals and uh, apply again. And finally, you get a very nice sort of display of uh, the application energy without uh, need for extra uh, mapping. Uh, so this is a new development which I believe can improve a workflow um, and uh, can, uh, can really allow to do the map with the same catheter uh, as ablation and uh, this can uh, maximize reproducibility of the ablation workflow. Well, thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, we can start discussion uh, to each presentation. First, the presentation of uh, uh, ablation of using deep freezing. Is there any question to this topic? You said that you are waiting some time. There are later occurrences of conduction up to after the, the freezing. Do you hear us? Yes, hello. <laughs> I already repeat my question. You said there is some waiting time, so do, do you observe some uh, later occurrences after the freezing uh, isolation? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Typically, as you might expect, with this sort of um, ablation modality, when the effect is not instantaneous, you can tell a lot from the time to effect. So if we see isolation within five or 10 seconds, it never comes back. Similar, of course, with the experience that exists with cryoballoon. Similar, by the way, for safety considerations, the phrenic nerve, um, which we will show you in the live case uh, for this technology. There is a very elegant way to mitigate the risk uh, because we can map. We can do cryo mapping and then decide to freeze. So, but to come back to the question, if the isolation happens very late into the freeze, let's say 50, 55 seconds in the freeze, then yes, it is likely that this will not be a permanent lesion and uh, that reconnection is possible and you should probably consider doing a, an additional application with a different geometry, different contact. Thank you. Is there any kind of question? Yeah, uh, this is Hiroshi. The, uh, long time ago, uh, cryocath has a circular catheter, the cryoablation, and then PB isolation was not easy. And then in a, the concept beginning is because the ice formation and I stick to the uh, endocardium, so therefore you don't have to worry about the uh, contact. And it turns out that's not true because the uh, ice is actually thermal insulator. So once the, uh, you have a freezing without electro contact before the freezing, then you are not making much effective region beyond the ice. So it was minus 80 degree, now minus 190, whatever. Is, uh, do you have any concern or contact that's not issue anymore or still important? Do you have any idea or any data? No, sure we have data. And I, I think um, you raise another very interesting point. So the existing experience with cryo is nitrous oxide. Like you said, is in hypothetical, theoretical, optimal conditions is minus 80 at the point where the gas evaporates. This is not necessarily the point where the catheter makes tissue contact. And then of course you have the heat sink of the blood. And this means that if you have a catheter with blood flowing over it, the minus 80 will translate in real life conditions to tissue temperatures of minus 40, minus 30, or even worse. And we know that we need to go below minus 30 to achieve lethal tissue temperatures to achieve permanent destruction. The key difference with this is the margin is simply much bigger. We start at minus 200 and we estimate um, 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 uh, temperatures at the tissue tip at the tissue catheter interface of minus 100 degrees Celsius. So the it is the the long story short. It is far more forgiving of energy application in an existing heat sink. This is basically why the cryo balloon needs to occlude and liquid nitrogen does not. Thank you. Okay. We are looking to the uh, life case and. Uh, question to the uh, other speaker, to Marco Scaglione. Is there any question? Oh, so so he is not in contact, so so he can't answer. Yeah, but it's a question to Professor okay, Scaglione. Okay, he is not. Sorry, he is not in contact now. Great. <laughs> You can, you can ask him later. So, some question to the new technique that was presented by Joseph Kautzner. It's not the case. So, I think we, we can conclude and... Uh, oh, uh, okay, the uh, Joseph, 
definitely uh, having the uh, combined with the Rizmia, because Rizmia mapping is uh, quite accurate for complex, uh, you know, activation map, and then uh, showing the uh, fair pass, you know, display with the um, magnetic location sensor. It makes difference. But again, going back, I'm sorry, I'm stick with the contact for today, but, uh, you know, like a uh, fast shot fair pass, almost always eliminating the old PV potential. Then uh, all clinical protocol, you need the, uh, at least a total 10 application per bay, right? Clinical trial. And the different cast orientation, try to get the amount of contact, watching a floor of hair pass looks like a almost buckling, buckling, something like that, you know. So that's maybe uh, pro providing a better idea of how much contact or something. Well, I, <clears throat> from my experience with intracardiac echo, I must say that if you place the catheter with intracardiac echo, you have always good contact, you don't need to measure. I think it doesn't matter if you have 5 grams or 10 grams with this technology, because it's, this is different from solid tip. And uh, the data we have, I mean, clinical data and recurrences are really very favorable. So I believe that it's more about the accuracy of placement rather than uh, too much about contact force. But of course, we have to see the long term data. But uh, this may improve this alignment because uh, the, the important thing is that you can see you can see, for instance, common osteum, or you can see the, the posterior part of the antrum, and you can place better uh, the catheter compared to X-ray, because an X-ray, it looks uh, pretty simple that you have wire in the vein and you just push the catheter into the, into the osteum, but it's not so simple, especially on the uh, on left side where veins are usually flat, and you have to maneuver a catheter with a sheath because it's non-steerable so you have to steer the sheath posterior and really play a little bit with that because otherwise you ablate a half in the appendage uh, in the blood and you have no contact you have no uh, good uh, lesion on the anterior ridge between appendage and, and veins so this is my feeling that maybe more than contact is a problem of uh, alignment with the with the osteum and th this technology merging with uh, arrhythmia can help or we can use it also for some mapping of uh, posterior wall if you if you want to to do uh, some mapping but uh, uh, the intracardiac echo is an alternative obviously and we we rely uh, at this moment on intracardiac echo